Excellency Gunhild Johan, ladies and gentlemen. Nine out of 10 scientific experiments are failures. And some of those are social experiments. Even though we invest a tremendous amount of money and effort and national pride in these social experiments, they still fail. This is Time Magazine this week in America. The question is, how do you determine if an experiment failed? You have to look at the outcome variables. And here, the outcome variables are now very clear. So I'm going to propose to you that you have all been unwitting subjects in a research protocol over the last 50 years, conducted by 10 principal investigators in a consortium arrangement around the world that said the following hypothesis. Processed food is better than real food. So what are the outcome variables that we have to look at to answer this question? Consumption, health, the environment, and then cash flow. And the cash flow has three parts, companies, consumers, and society. And we're going to take each of these in turn. Here's the experiment. 50 years ago, this is how it started. And here's the experiment as it looks today. And here are your 10 principal investigators, two of whom were in the room yesterday. So what is processed food? It's many things, but I'm going to list them for you. And there's data to support the contention that each of one of these is a problem. There's too little fiber. There's too little omega-3 fatty acids, which are anti-inflammatory. There's too little micronutrients. There's too much trans fats, too much branched-chain amino acids, which are found in corn-fed animal stock, too much omega-6 fatty acids, which are pro-inflammatory, too many additives, too many emulsifiers, which now we think may cause certain autoimmune diseases, too much salt. Now, there is correlative data for every single one of these but no causative data. And none of these drive your own individual consumption in particular. But the last one, the last one's the hook. And the last one is sugar. And sugar, and, Doc, and Gary Knell and Matthias Klum neglected to show you this National Geographic cover, says that sugar is very specifically addictive. In fact, According to the DSM-5 criteria for addiction, it now meets it. It's impossible to resist. And it is also the thing that covers up the negative aspects of taste of processed food. And the food industry knows that when they add it, you buy more. It is the marker for processed food. Because of the 600,000 items in the American food supply, 74% of them has added sugar, which Dr. Popkin told you. Let's take a look at salt, which was normally thought of as the uh, marker for processed food. Only 50% of those items have a greater than the recommendation for added salt. So sugar is the marker for processed food. And we will li limit our discussion for the rest of this time about sugar, specifically because we have the data. So let's talk about consumption. So everyone will say, well, we're eating more. And indeed, we, we are. Over on the left, we have the original White Castle hamburger. In the middle, we have Bob's Big Boy. And there on the right, we have Hardy's Thick Burger. And we even have a $6 burger at Carl's Jr. that has 2,000 calories. I call this slide very specifically the Coca-Cola conspiracy. And you can see all of the increases in sizes. So why do I call it a conspiracy? So what's in Coke? Caffeine, which is a diuretic, so you lose free water. Salt. So you take on more salt. What happens when you take on salt and lose free water? You get thirstier. So why is there so much sugar in Coke? To hide the salt. So here is how much sugar we in America have consumed, not in the last 30 years, but in the last 200 years. And there's the advent of processed food listed there in 1965. Now let's talk about health. So over the past 20 years, you can take a look and see Blood pressure down, uh, uh, cholesterol down, physical activity up, smoking down. We should be reaping a health benefit, and we are not, because obesity and diabetes are through the roof, absolutely through the roof, and they are chewing through all the health care costs of all developed and developing countries. 
The fiction is listed on this slide here. Coca-Cola says, beating obesity will take action by all of us based on one simple common sense fact. All calories count no matter where they come from, including Coca-Cola and everything else with calories. And they say it's common sense. Well, I don't believe in common sense. I believe in science. I believe in data. Because the science says some calories cause disease more than others because different calories are metabolized differently because a calorie is not a calorie. This is called nutritional biochemistry. And when you understand this, you understand that not all calories are the same, and sugar calories are the most egregious. I'm about to show you that slide that Femi mentioned. This is a study that we have just completed of 43 children with metabolic syndrome, Latino and African Americans, on a, who were studied on their normal diet, which consisted of quite a bit of sugar, and we then changed their diets for 10 days. We fed them to deliver the same number of calories with no change in weight, no change in fat, no change in protein, and no change in total carbohydrate. But we took the fructose out, the sugar out, and we added complex carbohydrate in. In other words, we took the pastries out and added the bagels in. Everybody got it? No change in weight. 10 days. Take a look here. The subcutaneous fat did not change, and that's good. But take a look at that liver fat. 29% reduction in the span of 10 days. Visceral fat, 10% reduction. Pancreatic fat, they're not supposed to have pancreatic fat, people. <laughs> Three quarters of them, the pancreatic fat went down. And when we did the uh, further analysis, it turned out it was all about the liver fat. Every aspect of their metabolic health improved. Because their liver fat improved, the visceral fat had no effect. The visceral fat was along for the ride. So this is about liver fat, and fructose drives liver fat accumulation. We also know that sugar-sweetened beverages increase risk for diabetes. This is a study from the Epic Interact study, where every sugar beverage, controlling for obesity and controlling for uh, total calories, increases your risk for diabetes by 29%. And our study, which was an econometric study, showed that calories did not drive worldwide obesity, but sugar did 11-fold for the same number of calories. And this uh, study meets proximate cause, because increased dose increased diabetes, increased duration, increased diabetes, directionality, those countries where sugar went down, less diabetes, and most important for cause precedence, three years. Whenever sugar changed in a country, diabetes changed in the same direction three years later. This is a study that came out last year showing cardiovascular mortality increasing as the percent of calories of added sugar in the diet also increased and more than half of the U.S. population has an increased risk for heart disease death due to their added sugar consumption. So we have causation for the following four diseases, sugar and diabetes, heart disease, fatty liver disease, and tooth decay. We have correlation, not causation, for cancer and dementia, but we're working on those. Now, how about the environment? Worldwide Wildlife Federation Fund says soil erosion, phosphate runoff, take a look at the Everglades. Here you can see in light green, orange, and yellow, that's all sugar rather than Everglades. And the same thing, of course, has happened in the Amazon. The deforestation, that's part of the CO2 problem, is killing the environment. And now, finally, cash flow. First to companies. So processed foods and sweets doubling. Big increase, big improvement in terms of cash flow, right? And you can see that in their stock prices. Here's the S&P 500, and here's the stock price for McDonald's, Coke, and Pepsi from 2007 to 2011. Uh, this, unfortunately, is turned, so I'll skip it. But most recently, sugar company is not doing so well because the word is out. And now soft drink manufacturers are also now experiencing a drought for the first time. You know that McDonald's fired its CEO just two months ago, and Coca-Cola just fired 1,800 employees to save $3 billion, and you know what they're going to do with those $3 billion? Invest in children's marketing. Now let's talk about consumers. So take a look at the price of food. Healthy food costs double that of unhealthy food, and it's going up at a rate of 17 pence per pound compared to processed food, which is 7 pence per pound. So you'd say, well, wait, that means that processed food's a better deal. Less healthy food is a better deal. Well. Indeed, the three countries that have the lowest GDP spent on food, US, UK, and Australia, of course, are the three most obese and the three sickest countries. 
but take a look at the other end. Here are the hospital, pharma, and physician costs compared to total healthcare costs, and they don't add up. And that's because chronic metabolic disease is what's chewing through all of these healthcare costs. Now let's do society. Here's that processed food uh, uh, slide I showed you. Now I'm going to overlay on it the percent of GDP spent in America on healthcare. And unfortunately, it's been moved, but basically they line up. We don't have the treatment paradigm, we have the sugar paradigm. And when you do the math on this, the food industry grosses one trillion a year, of which 450 is gross profit. But in the US, we spend 2.7 trillion on healthcare, of which 75% is chronic metabolic disease, of which 75% of that is preventable. That's $1.4 trillion a year going down a rat hole. We lose triple what the food industry makes. This is unsustainable. You want to talk sustainability? Here's sustainability right here. And Social Security requires young people who are healthy to pay in. Well, now they're sick and they're taking out. And Social Security is crumbling all over the world. This is from Morgan Stanley showing the rate of economic growth based on our obesity and diabetes epidemics, based on high sugar in orange and low sugar in blue. And if we're on high sugar, which is where we are now, we are approaching zero economic growth by the year 2035. Mars, the candy company, knows this. And they came out in support of the US dietary guidelines to reduce added sugar consumption to 10% or less. A candy company, sugar is their stock and trade, and they know this. And why do they know this? Because they're privately held. Because they don't have to make Wall Street reports. Because they don't have to worry about their jobs. That's what this is about, people. So, let's do the scorecard. Consumption, way up. Health, disaster. In fact, if this were an IRB protocol, it would have been stopped years ago because of the deaths. Environment, clearly negative. Companies, up previously, but now in big trouble. Consumers, in the short term, a winner. In the long term, a big fat loser. And finally, in society, a disaster. Now, Dr. Katz told you today that there were many diets that worked. Every one of the diets that worked was a low sugar, high fiber diet. Do you know what a low sugar, high fiber diet is called, people? It's called real food. That's what every single diet that works is, is real food. Processed food is an experiment that failed. We should rename diabetes processed food disease because that's what it is. And that's where it comes from and that's what it is and that's how we will educate the public. And I also suggest as a second proposal if we got rid of federal subsidies for all of these commodity crops, which are driving this metabolic disease epidemic, we could solve this problem. The only pr uh, uh, crop that would go up in price, sugar. The Giannini Foundation from Berkeley found that. Only sugar, and that's what we need. We have started a nonprofit to change the conversation. It's called the Institute for Responsible Nutrition. We want to partner with EAT. There's our website, and I'm happy for any and all comments. Thank you so much.